Hi, everyone. I'm really grateful to be here. My name is Anthem Blanchard. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Parasoft. We are an enterprise software company specializing in cybersecurity solutions for governments, private enterprises. And I'm here today just to give you a little bit of a brief, um, effectively, on um, Web3 and really how it interrelates here with cybersecurity. So I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen here and be able to provide you with a little bit more information here. So we're going to start out um, with really just the multi-trillion, six trillion dollars in counting here estimates. So, you know, we can see here estimated over 10 trillion dollars of cost by 2025 here by this um, cybersecurity ventures group here. Um, so, you know, really, really prolific. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, really an architectural problem here. Um, you know, six trillion again here, they're cited. Um, and, and really just uh, recently, um, you know, just in August this year, um, you know, last month, we, we saw the attacks uh, against the, the Taiwanese infrastructure by the Chinese government effectively here. So two, you know, tier one governments effectively battling. Um, and effectively as a last resort, we see Web3 tools, IPFS and Ethereum being used here. So, um, you know, point being, when tier one G8 type attacks are occurring, you know, we've got the, the digital minister of Taiwan admitting uh, or saying really more than admitting on, on their national uh, television that they were using uh, Web3 here really because um, it has never been struck down for a second. So far, it has not been successfully attacked at all. It uses a Web3 structure tied to the global blockchain community and the global web two backbone network. So, um, you know, very, very, very powerful statement here. So um, this is why it's relevant. So, um, you know, really, um, you know, looking at cloud, um, you know, we're looking at massive, massive, massive uh, move, you know, going to cloud, you know, right now, over half of commerce is now on the cloud, according to Gartner Group. Um, and, and really, when we look at the cloud infrastructure, you know, it is incredibly um, centralized. Um, you know, we, we're, we're looking at effectively, you know, one market player, Amazon controlling a third of the market plus the second and Microsoft half the market. So um, very, very, very centralized. So really what we're seeing here, the internet's about 30 years old commercially, and we're seeing this all of these aggregations, you know, real centralizations of cloud. And um, these are serial networks. So, you know, when we look at the spend on cloud infrastructure here, you know, I mean, it's sizable here. I mean, you're looking full year 2021 estimates of about 74 billion. You know, that was, you know, over 2020, you know, only a 9% increase. However, we have here that the costs are in, the you know closing in on tens of trillions of dollars a year so um effectively there there is a structural issue um so so we're going to get into that here next and um you know really kind of looking in this next question you're right how the internet is a serial uh, a series of serial networks and and really how the commercialization of web3 represents the scaling of it, the internet and, and really by integrating these parallel networks which are these web three layers of software so bitcoin is a web three layer of software bitcoin's database called the blockchain is the world's strongest database on the planet that is bitcoin's layer it's protocol software's most valuable function it is the most valuable database in the world because it is the most incorruptible and therefore has the most integrity um, you know, we look at Ethereum, for example, Ethereum is the world's strongest computer processor, single layer protocol, uh, web three layer of software. So uh, effectively, you know, by integrating these layers together, effectively, um, you know, we, we have basically, you know, kind of the keys here. And, you know, if we can kind of just take a look here, it's kind of going into our company's history here, so I'm not going to bore you too much with that, but we've been in the Web3 game for about um, 10 years, roughly. And 
um, it really say game because it hasn't really commercialized until very recently. So it's all been speculative. So everything that you've seen in the news about NFTs and uh, DeFi and Metaverse and uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, of course, you know, all of this is pre-commercial. However, you know, it, it's close to a trillion dollars and at one point multi-trillion dollar liquid speculation and um, really upward channel, uh, you know, massively the last decade plus. So um, we've kind of been focusing on ransomware first, kind of caught our attention. Then we kind of realized cybersecurity more generally. Ransomware, keep in mind, was a zero problem a decade ago. And once these software keys, referred to as cryptocurrencies, became materially valuable enough to effectively become money or currency substitutes, national currency, bank payments, the lid came off ransom. So you know, ransoming was actually a thing in the 1980s. You'd have these rogue programmers effectively that would program, you know, one out of every so many copies, uh, some malware, and then you would have to send a paper check to some PO box or equivalent in some account, typically offshore US. And back before the early 90s, you could clear those checks. So, um, you know, the banking system through uh, the Federal Reserve system, through the SWIFT system, basically put an end to distributed clearing of payments. And so really, you know, we saw the world benefited for you know, over two decades effectively with really, you know, reduced ransoms, kidnappings, of course, you know, being the most dangerous to us violently, directly, and, and also really computer ransoms. So, um, you know, then all of a sudden once, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then other, you know, uh, public protocol keys became a material value, we started seeing these ransomwares escalate, these attacks. Um, and this is, you know, really simplistic look, a centralized versus a decentralized system here. And, and really, they're not actually versus because they both have the same attributes of single points of failure. So, you know, oftentimes we think of the internet as kind of a distributed web. Uh, and we think of a lot of times as Bitcoin, public protocols or Ethereum is kind of decentralized. However, you know, I would say that the internet's actually more like a, a kind of a, a centralized, decentralized grid. I mean, we just saw how prolific, you know, very few of these cloud players effectively, um, the whole internet relies on them. And, and that, that is more and more the trend of more and more centralization effectively. Um, and then effectively, you know, we have all of these points, like all of us sitting on the edge of the networks, effectively devices. Um, and, and that's kind of like the decentralized kind of ends, but there's all of these attacks and that's why the costs are in the estimates of, of you know, six, seven trillion dollars this year of cybersecurity costs, you know, from all of the abuse of the network. So where do we need to go effectively? You know, this kind of gets into the question of, you know, how public protocols, Web3 or ransomware proof, 100% uptime, perfect data integrity systems. So, um, and, and it really comes down 100% uptime is their distributed nature. So it basically an elimination of single points of failure. Um, our company uh, actually launched a layer two Ethereum public protocol called Hercules uh, in 2018. And um, effectively, you know, it is a distributed network like all public protocols are by design effectively. Um, you know, they're 100% uptime software of a cloud, which is unheard of before with centralized cloud, you know, so as long as the Bitcoin, for example, or Ethereum, for example, layer holds those layered distributed clouds effectively are hundred percent uptime and the data that they save in their databases, again, referred to typically database blockchain, same word, um, are incorruptible. So, um, you know, that's really, that's really critical. So, um, you know, kind of important to understand. Um, you know, we, we, we've got a couple of products here and I'm not going to spend too much time on this is really more educational, but point being is that you can use these layers and very, very simple stack formations, um, you know, with both web two and web three layers effectively integrated to create basic commercial data integrity, network security, data security, and other cybersecurity tool sets effectively. So, um, you know, and, and kind of, kind of just to understand a little bit more. Um, I, I think about, you know, why, why specifically now, um, you know, we have these trends, but, you know, what about, what about also the trends in effectively 
IT and IoT. And, and here really what I'm talking about is, is automation and really, you know, we, we you know, say operational technology, basically anywhere, you know, internet of things, anywhere where basically we have a series of automated um, physical items, you know, think machinery, um, factories could be in and out of the factory, warehousing, trucking, shipping, um, all examples, you know, really we could benefit society, safety, efficiencies um, from this automation. But automation needs trust layers that they can rely upon. So um, to get true end-to-end -end automation. So, um, you know, the other issue we've got with a lot of hardware devices is that they're in a lot of cases impossible to have identity certificates on them. Uh, and this is a, a really, really big point. So, um, you know, traditionally with IT, uh, information technology, central you know, network security systems, let's say, right, we know about 90% roughly of all cybersecurity attacks come from stealing credentials of a user that then allows the hacker to gain access to ultimately system admin privileges and ultimately abuse, run rampant, you know, ransom, a host of, you know, erase, corrupt, um, you know, the network. Um, so uh, effectively here, um, we need to have a way to be able to integrate because it's happening, whether um, Internet of Things and, and likes it or not, you know, it's demanding basically, you know, in these kind of SCADA, industrial, traditional hardware um, intensive environments, basically, digital identifiers that can be identified universally. Um, and this is really where um, really Web3 can come in handy effectively. You can use unique markers effectively of Web3 for identity purposes on any device effectively, even if it's not uh, a full uh, computer effectively. So that is, I think, a really, really, really important point um, to basically glean upon. Um, and, and really kind of how it projects against hijacking, I think, is another critical point because, you know, it, it basically, when we, when we think about, again, these centralized systems, the hijacking is coming from being able to take administrative control and all that metadata sitting within the system, the central cloud construct. Um, whereas with the Web3 construct, all the metadata sits locally on the user's device, you know, on their phone, computer, you know, automobile, whatever it is, truck, whatever it is, on machinery, wherever that device is sitting. So it, it basically eliminates these honeypots effectively that exist that, you know, currently, you know, we're plagued by because that's basically the architecture and construct of central cloud. So um, we're basically able to, with Web3, distribute the information and effectively the system admin, you know, still has to have control from the client standpoint. However, the, the identity instruments that are being issued that are Web3 instruments, it's impossible to forge the key mentors. Um, like no one's ever forged, for example, a Bitcoin key or an Ethereum key. Um, so it's impossible to forge the key or the key mentors. So that's a big, big difference, right? Plenty, plenty, you know, from you know, thinking back RSA over a decade ago with, you know, their secure ID mentor hack. You know, this year we had the famous Opta hack that, that went public. So, you know, we've seen these central architectures um, being plagued effectively by bad actors. We know that the numbers here um, don't add up. You know, cloud providers are only spending, you know, almost a hundred billion a year and, and the damages are escalating you know, six trillion, seven trillion, you know, increasing by about a trillion or more uh, a year now. And so it's an architectural problem, very, very clearly. That's the only way that these kind of numbers can be possible. We're talking about securing our commerce, right? Everything that we do relies on digital and the internet working. So, um, you know, this is really why uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that, you know, TBI, Totoro Brea Institute has provided us with. Um, thank you, TBI. Um, you know, thank you to the team there, uh, Joe and Miguel, and all of you um, on the team. And, you know, I would love to hear from you. Um, you know, would love to reach out um, if, if, you know, you would like to learn more um, about me or, or us. You know, you're welcome to contact me here. It's my cell phone. 
you can text me. You can, of course, email me uh, as well um, or email me. Um, and would love to share more. Or if you'd like to um, basically, you know, get in touch with, with me through uh, TBI, of course, you can do that too. So um, again, you know, really thank you. Um, really, it's a, a pleasure and uh, appreciative of, of the time. And um, I hope to hear from you soon. And I uh, hope you stay safe and, uh, and hope you stay well. Thank you very much again for the opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you uh, hopefully soon. Take care. Thank you.